Uh, well, thanks everyone for, for logging in uh, this evening. We are very fortunate uh, and very privileged uh, this evening to have with us uh, uh, Dr. Ambiga Srinivasan, who is one of the preeminent litigators uh, in our jurisdiction. And uh, Dr. Ambi will be speaking to us about a topic that she is very familiar with and uh, certainly an expert in, which is the role of litigators in the advancement of human rights and the rule of law in uh, Malaysia. Uh, Dr. Ambi, a uh, very warm welcome to you. Thank you for sparing the time to speak to us. Thank you very much, uh, Greg. Thank you for inviting me. Could I start by asking if you could tell us about yourself and your practice as well? Okay, uh, I won't say much. Uh, I've been in practice for 40 years. Um, and uh, I started at Screen. Uh, I, I left after 19 years. I was a partner when I left. I joined Tommy Thomas for about uh, over a year. And um, then I left to start my own firm and we've just celebrated our 20th anniversary. So, <laughs> so we've been, the firm has been around for 20 years, <laughs> which is nice to know. <laughs> Fantastic. And, and why did you decide to become a litigator? Okay, um, why litigation? Frankly, I wouldn't have considered any other uh, practice area, to be honest. Um, you know, I, I, when I have to look at an agreement in a litigation matter, um, I will read it thoroughly and read every clause. But if you told me to redraft that same agreement, uh, it, it's not something that comes very easily to me, honestly. So I have a lot of respect for those in the corporate sector uh, because they're doing something I, I would find very, very difficult to do. And I think I've always wanted... Uh, I debated in school. I've always liked to speak. I've always loved advocacy. Yeah. Right. And if I can ask you uh, about the two, um, broadly speaking, the two facets of advocacy, both written and uh, oral advocacy. Uh, first of all, uh, what would you say are the three main uh, uh, tips for effective written advocacy? Okay, yes, that's something I think we need to uh, we need to consider. It's not when we started practice, when I started practice, we didn't have that. So we've had to adapt. And, uh, and I, okay, this is not exhaustive. And, and I think in both written and oral, uh, being uh, honest and frank with the court is a given, okay? So besides that, I would say where written uh, submissions are concerned, that we need to remember that it's not an academic thesis because I've read many uh, submissions where they've gone on and on about the law and they set out extensively passages from cases, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that that uh, uh, defeats the purpose because what you want to do is to keep the attention of the person who's reading it. So that's the first thing I would say that to remember that it's not an academic thesis. You're there to answer specific issues and to deal with specific issues. So there must be clarity as to those issues. And that's something you need to do uh, up front. So that'll be my second point, which is you must highlight the issues um, from the start. And I would always recommend that you add a chronology, uh, especially where the facts are complex. Uh, when they're uh, complex, then I think it's better to have a, a chronology at the back or somewhere to assist the court. Now, you need to remember that, uh, that in fact, uh, the, uh, uh, what do you call it, that when judges reserve judgment, uh, maybe for a few months, I'm, a, I'm pretty certain when it comes to writing the judgment that they would go straight to your written submissions. Yeah. So a lot of people say, ah, never mind what the written submissions say, what I say orally will matter more. Well, no, I think really your written submissions must be as good as your oral submissions and uh, must capture the attention of the court as to what are the key issues. So that's point number two, to remember that written submissions are very important. And then of course, um, I would say, thirdly, that you need to be absolutely upfront on the law with, uh, uh, with the uh, court. Because although, I mean, it's written, it's there in print, 
and uh, and you have to if there are points which are not in your favor it's quite good to deal with them in your submissions up front obviously you would start with your strong points but you would also look at your weaker points and and also make sure that your authorities say what you say they do uh, and uh, be as comprehensive as possible that's it could have been gone uh, gone more than three points there, I think. <laughs> but anyway, that's that's about it. Yeah, for the written submissions. Yeah. Thanks. And what about oral advocacy? What 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 would you say are the three main um, tips for effective oral advocacy? Okay, so oral advocacy. The advantage is that you can emphasize, and I think you need to actually use that advantage. Um, and obviously, um, you know, uh, in Zoom, because now we have Zoom as well, you have to adjust your advocacy a little bit. <coughs> Excuse me. And for that, actually, I have found using charts quite helpful. Uh, so I think to emphasize, and especially if you have a chronology that is complex, it's quite good to put timelines uh, on uh, on Zoom, that does help. Uh, so I would say that the first thing is to use the power of emphasis and to use it uh, effectively, be clear right from the start what your case is about. And there is a difference in the advocacy when you are appellant, if it's in the Court of Appeal, and advocacy when you're the respondent. Uh, Having the right of first speech is always a huge advantage, okay? And you need to be prepared as a respondent because you don't have that advantage. You need to respond, not necessarily being drawn into the way in which the appellant has framed the case, but into the, you need to start with the way you want to frame the case. So that, that's uh, one of the things that I've, I've uh, learned. Then of course, number two, I would say you must master your facts. You must master your facts, be prepared to answer questions on the spot. It's not like written submissions. You need to be, you need to have them at your fingertips. And I think you will know whether it's trial, cross-examination, et cetera, et cetera. You will know that most of the cases are decided largely on the facts. The facts do speak for themselves to a large extent. And therefore, I've always found that when you master the facts, you will know how to do your submissions and you can answer any questions that come at you. So that's uh, 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 number two. Number three is building trust, building the trust of the bench. And you do that by being absolutely frank. And um, I have on occasion made a mistake and maybe pointed out by the other side. I always apologize and say, yes, that's correct. That was an error. That is not uh, the way, uh, you know, that the, the fact, uh, whatever I said was not absolutely accurate and correct yourself. So that is better than to try and get away with, uh, oops, I made a mistake, but I think I'll just keep quiet about it. So I think the third, and I would say one of the most important things is building the trust with the bench so that when you speak, they know they can trust what you say. So that, those are the three things I would say. I'm sure there are a lot more, but those are three, yeah. Thanks for that. Uh, and if I can now uh, move on to the uh, specific topic of the session. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, how did you become involved in uh, human rights and public interest disputes in your practice? You know, um, this would be from very right at the beginning. Uh, when I started my career, I was so taken up. I used to go to bar council meetings and... Uh, uh, not council meetings, but bar, AGMs, etc. And I used to be so taken up with the likes of Karpal and Karam Singh and Raja Aziz. And they did a lot of public interest work. And I actually did work with uh, Raja Aziz on some of those. Um, and, and it was a pleasure working on, on those cases. We always lost, actually, in those days, any <laughs> anti-government <laughs> cases, you would lose. I mean, Raja Aziz used to say that. He said, yes, you know, but I, I always lose, he said, he, he said that before. So, yes, and you get used to that, though. And then, of course, you know, with the 1988 crisis, I think a lot of people were very, very uh, offended by what happened in the 1988 crisis. So a lot of people 
uh, felt that it, it, it was time for the bar to stand up, the bar did stand up. So I suppose I went into human rights uh, cases because of the circumstances at that time. The ISA was used indiscriminately, newspapers got uh, suspended. This was 88, uh, 87, 88, and so on, Operation La Lang and all of that. So as a lawyer, you couldn't but get interested in human rights issues. So, and, and to be honest, uh, the firm I was in screen were very, very supportive of uh, human rights and public interest work. Yeah. And, and why do you think it is important for, for lawyers generally to get involved in such issues? Well, if lawyers don't, who will? Uh, it's got to be us. If we believe not just in the law, but in the rule of law, then we must stand up every time the rule of law is undermined or offended in some way. If not us, who? Uh, and, and I think that's why you cannot escape it. Uh, but I know a lot of lawyers don't want to go into actually doing the litigation uh, for human rights cases. But I, I personally think it's a must. Uh, when, when I started this practice, uh, we decided that at least eight to 10% of our work, let's say approximately 10% of our work would be either public interest or pro bono work. And we tried to keep that up. I'm not sure whether we kept the percentages up. We do a lot of pro bono and public interest work. And the lawyers who come in here learn a lot from that actually. So my own view is it's inevitable. If you believe in the rule of law, you must look at human rights and uh, and public interest work positively. You also have a, a active uh, commercial practice uh, at the commercial bar. Um, could you explain how you've been able to balance the two, your, your commercial practice uh, with your uh, involvement in public interest and the human rights disputes? Well, um, you know what, there's, there's no, okay. The commercial law work is what keeps the firm going, right? And there's nothing wrong with lawyers wanting to make money. But I do believe that a part of what we do must be to give back to society. It's not just enough to just do your work and earn money. So that's the balance, actually. Uh, obviously, um, it's difficult to do 50-50, I suppose. I'm, I, I think we do at least 10. But in some weeks, I have so many pro bono and human rights cases, right? <laughs> Uh, the commercial cases come after that. So the, the balance to be struck is that obviously you have to be commercial and you have to do work that keeps the firm going. But you, you have to do work that allows you to also do pro bono work. Because for me, that's important. And by the way, the bar has a fantastic legal aid system. And that's something that was there when I started practice. And the firms must encourage lawyers to do pro bono work, legal aid work, to, to, to you know, basically support our legal aid uh, uh, scheme. So I think that's, uh, that's something that, that can be done. It can be achieved. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. Uh, do you think the, the uh, present dynamics at the bar, um, namely how fast-paced uh, practice has become, do you think that has made um, uh, it, it made it is difficult to balance the two, the commercial practice and involvement in the other issues. Yeah, you, you're right, actually, because I think courts call up cases much more quickly now. It's much more efficient. But um, I still do it. I mean, we still do it here. So I, I think you can strike a balance. It can get a little bit overwhelming sometimes. But um, really, if, if I told you 90s, 10, that's shouldn't be difficult to achieve. We, I think we actually go beyond that in our firm, but really at least some, some uh, pro bono and, 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 but yes, you're right. All cases get called up much more quickly and uh, you need more hands on deck. And I tell you what I do though, and it's possibly because of my seniority, I can. I do get lawyers from outside other firms uh, with permission, of course, of the uh, uh, lawyers in charge. Uh, to assist. And when it comes to pro bono, they're actually uh, interested, interested in learning. So that's one way of doing it. Get your younger ones to get more uh, involved in it. Yeah. 
has there has there ever been an occasion in your practice where your uh, involvement in these public interest and human rights issues uh, has affected your commercial practice? Oh yes, without a doubt. You know, um, it's when I was when I was doing Berse, for example, um, and when I used to, uh, yeah, I think it was mainly Berse, and when I was bar president and so on and so forth, and I spoke up on issues, it did affect my practice. Uh, because you wouldn't get onto panels of banks and other other such GLCs and all. You will you will not get that type of work. But I was lucky. I, I have partners who completely understood that, accepted that that to be the case. Um, and yes, it is. It, it did affect the kind of work that I would get. And in fact, um, you, you, I I think when the, there was a change of government. My work went up, okay, increased, uh, and then went back again after there was a change again. So you see, uh, the commercial world is very, very sensitive to uh, who who the lawyer is, who they think can you know get them more mileage, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But we must also remember that there are people who want to take on the government as well. Uh, so then that's the kind of work we get. We get quite a lot of that we, we get the defense work uh that that's so that makes up in a sense for the loss uh of the other the plaintiffs type of work yeah and uh ambi what role do you think litigation plays in the uh, advancement of human rights and uh, rule of law uh, in this country at least oh i i think it plays a vital role actually uh uh for me when uh, when a matter goes before court, before the court, that's an impartial, independent tribunal. Uh, so, for example, if you want to hold a minister accountable, all right, you go by way of judicial review, uh, and even a minister has to swear an affidavit to explain sometimes the reason why he made certain decisions. You can only get that through the court. So. Uh, so it is. It it plays a huge role. Uh, litigation, strategic litigation. That's something that is new that is coming up. Uh, for example, I'm a firm believer that uh, issues relating to climate change should be the subject of of strategic litigation. So, in other words, public interest litigation, uh, litigation that actually helps more than the people who bring the the action. Uh, and I think uh, advocacy in court is one of the best ways because the one thing you cannot file a false affidavit. Although I'm not saying you cannot. I mean, obviously, the the the, the authorities should not file affidavits that are not uh, truthful. And then there's an independent arbiter who decides on the case. So I I think it's a very important. Uh, tool in a sense to use the strategic litigation yeah do you think our present laws on standing legal standing uh, provide an avenue for strategic litigation in our country well i think with the case law and i think ntuc if i'm not mistaken is one of the latest ones uh, in uh, the federal court decision where they went to court to ask for i think the slang or water concession agreements and the federal court uh, held that the NTUC had local standard. And I actually think we may see an opening up of, of the local standard, uh, although you still have the ouster clauses and 101 other things, but uh, where the court wishes, thinks an intervention is necessary, I think they, they, they will intervene. Uh, it may still not be that easy, let me tell you, for uh, to get orders against the government. Uh, they hide be behind, you know, national security or whatever it is, then it gets difficult if that's the case. But I personally think we're at a stage uh, in the uh, uh, judiciary where they are actually much more open than they have been in the past. Yeah. So uh, just speaking on principles a little bit, um, there are presently some principles uh, that, that make it a little difficult to, to take on the government or to take on the authorities. 
Um, and one particular area is on the issue of justiciability. Uh, there are some decisions that presently are, are not justiciable. Now, when, when one is faced with uh, those kind of uh, precedents and those binding precedents of, um, of the higher courts, um, should that on its own deter a person from uh, advising a potential litigant to take on a human rights dispute or a public interest dispute? Well, in those cases, I, I would always advise the client, obviously, that it's uphill. But you must never stop pushing the envelope. Uh, and you know what? You, you have to think outside the box sometimes and, and keep pushing because, look, you may not succeed today, but you may in five years' time. So I would say never, never stop. And, and let me tell you, I've gone to court knowing I will lose in many, many cases, okay? But you still do it because it is a form of accountability. It forces the other side to account for some of their actions. They may still succeed at the end of the day, but it, it is the process that is important. It's just like, for example, Suhakam, okay? Uh, Suhakam has hearings. You appear before Suhakam, you go through uh, everything, you get a written, you know that it, there's no legal effect to that written uh, 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 report at the end of the day, the findings at the end of the day. Uh, it may or may not be read in Parliament, you don't know. But the fact that, for example, like in Versailles, okay, we had an inquiry, so how come inquiry? The fact that the policeman had to sit in the witness box and be cross-examined and answer questions, that in itself, I'm telling you, brought a change in the way in which they handled peaceful assemblies, mm. okay? So the process is as important as the result, if not more important sometimes, because you can't control the result, but you can have some control over the process. So the process can yield very interesting and positive results. So I would still go for it. Yeah. And uh, are, there, are there occasions when uh, it may be advisable not to litigate a human rights dispute and instead uh, try to obtain redress in a, uh, through another form? Um, yeah, I mean, I think if there's no legal basis or there is a real problem uh, and where I suppose in certain cases, and I know this for a fact, uh, for example, some of the citizenship cases, I mean, a few years ago, when I suggested to a couple of parents that they should take it to court, they were very reluctant for the simple reason that they didn't want to sue the very body that was going to decide the issue of citizenship. So, so that's a dilemma. And a lot of people avoid going to court and suing because then they don't want to go to the bottom of the list. So each situation has to be judged according to its circumstance. And at the end of the day, it is up to the litigant to make the final call, whether they're prepared to take on uh, the authorities. And I tell you something, that is a very real fear uh, for pub, uh, those who take up, private citizens who take up these issues against the government. Um, so it, it is difficult enough for them to go to court. And uh, I, I, I think the, the courts are appreciative of that. Uh, all those, uh, and most of the time, if you notice, if it's public interest, they don't order costs. You can actually make a submission that because it's a public interest issue, and this is a poor citizen trying to get redress, that no costs are ordered, and the courts have been quite open to that. So that's an interesting development, actually. Yeah. Sure. Now, uh, uh, I mean, human rights disputes that that um, end up in court are often uh, high-profile disputes, uh, high-profile cases. And you often have a, a, a senior barrister uh, leading in the arguments. Um, are, is there scope for younger litigators to take the lead in such cases, to appear as lead counsel? In oh, those cases? I, I, okay. L let me tell you, this is something I am looking at. I actually think when you look at issues concerning climate change, for example, I believe that is something that the younger lawyers should lead, right? 
because it is about their future. It is about their future. Uh, what we're doing to the climate, uh, what we're doing about addressing climate change is, is really quite inadequate. So my own view is that we must encourage the younger lawyers to do uh, 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 such cases. Whether high profile or not, it doesn't matter because I think that they are earnest at that, at that level. I think they're, they're, they're earnest and you must always give them a chance to uh, actually appear and argue these cases. Of course, we can be there to help in uh, here and there and take one or two points, but it's always important to make them, uh, make them come forward. And my own view is when it comes to climate change, the younger lawyers should be the ones who take the lead. You, you mentioned earlier your your uh, experience with uh, Raja Aziz and uh, how he said that he often loses in the cases that the public interest cases that he that he takes up. Um, have you found it to be challenging and disheartening at times uh, when you often don't get the results you're seeking in uh, such cases? And if yes, how have you handled uh, that uh, that that emotion? Uh, okay, number one, unfortunately, you do get used to it, <laughs> which which you shouldn't, but you do. And you know, uh, your dad and I did the election cases that was very, very, uh, one after the other, we did several. Uh, and I think Prof Gudial was in it as well. Well, you kind of expect it actually, you kind of expect it because you're taking on an entire system. You've got to expect that you may lose. You hope you will win, but you're, it is always disappointing. But I think what you need to remember is it is never a waste of time. Never is it a waste of time to put forward a case uh, that you have, which in your judgment is a fair point to make. Put it forward. You may lose, but it is never a waste of time because you just don't know when you might actually come before a panel or, or a judge who may accept your point. May not, and it may not be today, may happen a few years down uh, down the line or it may result in new legislation so so my own view is that the process as i said is as important as the result um, and i think it can make up for a bad result if you at least got a chance to articulate your point but i can tell you uh, greg it's very frustrating it can be very frustrating <laughs> I'm, you get, I'm, but you get used to it, you know, unfortunately, like Rajas is this. <laughs> sure. I have uh, just one final question. Um, what steps uh, could the younger lawyers in our firm and even elsewhere uh, take to become more involved in uh, human rights and public interest disputes in our country? Well, you know what? I would actually join the committees of the Bar Council. Uh, they have several. They have the human rights one, they have the Orang Asli, whichever. Uh, but there are many uh, human rights uh, uh, subcommittees of the Bar Council. Join them, because from there you will know where your, your, your time is needed. Look, uh, Stephen does all the Orang Asli work. That's, he's been doing it for years, okay, from, from the start, as far as I can remember. Uh, I've done, you know, a, a lot of stuff right from the side, and a lot of it started by getting involved with the bar council. So, and and I think what will be good for your uh, lawyers is if you encourage them to work with others outside the firm. Uh, if you want, if they want some exposure, uh, you know, sometimes Gopal calls me and says, "Hey, my my student wants, uh, you know, you just give me a shout and he'll help," and I, and we get them to help. So it's easier when your firm is smaller frankly. Yeah. Uh, although I will say with Screen, when I was in Screen, they always encouraged us to take part in and, and do the kind of, that kind of work. So I would say tie up with the Bar Council, get involved with the Bar Council subcommittees, and then ask your partners or you ask, uh, make arrangements for your legal assistants to do some work with other lawyers. Now there are many, many firms out there, not just the big firms, uh, with senior lawyers. So I, uh, that's my suggestion, uh, Greg. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambias. Very, very, all very useful points. Do you mind if I open up the floor to the oh, um, firm? Uh, sure. to 
Great, thanks so much. To see if they had questions of their own. So, if uh, anybody wanted to ask uh, Ambi a question, please do go ahead. So the ones joining us, uh, Ambi, today are our associates, and I think a few, one or two of our partners as well. Right. No questions. I, I actually had another question, Ambi. Um, sure. you, you've been you've been speaking about your involvement in public interest and, uh, and rule of law matters. Have you have you ever thought of um, doing anything else apart from litigation uh, to to advance your interest in in that area, like perhaps politics or something else? I knew you were going to do that, okay? Because your father is always saying, "Look, you should go." Oh, really? Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. <laughs> But uh, I would never go into politics. I can't stomach the politics of this. I can't deal with it, actually. Uh, so I would rather use my legal skills, uh, you know, uh, uh, to, to move to, to in, in relation to such strategic litigation and, and uh, advocacy. But don't forget, I do do, uh, I like uh, Bersay, uh Right, so <laughs> that's how I, I I channel that energy as well. So it's it's law, my work, and also uh, civil society activism. Um, and I the the what I learned in Bursay was was amazing actually, because I went from being a bar president. The next thing I did was chairman of Bursay. The, the thought process, the way they do things is very, very different. They are amazing people, civil society, okay? They literally put their liberty and their lives on the line for the causes that they fight. And, and I think when you see that, it makes you realize, you know, what we do it by just going to court is actually a lot safer. Yes. Right? They actually do a lot more. And so I suppose it gives you perspective. And, and it certainly helped me when I argued when I argued public interest cases, uh, and it, and I also, you know, I have a, I, I respect all these people who the civil society activists who have been fighting causes for years before I even came on the scene. Sure, but would you say uh, it attempting to effect change through civil society movements is uh, a little bit more effective than doing so through the courts? Uh, I think they can be both effective, but yes, civil society movements are very effective. With Bursay, let, let me tell you, because I, I know mainly about Bursay. After Bursay 2, we had, we had the Peace School Assembly Act. Uh, an electoral reform committee was set up. Uh, changes were brought to the electoral laws. We got indelible ink and all of that. So it was very effective. Uh, but your numbers have to be that big, you know, <laughs> as big as the per se crowds. Now I'm not sure with COVID whether you'll get that, but uh, still, it's, no. it's an effective tool, but so are the courts. Because when judges interpret the laws, having the rule of law in mind and, uh, uh, you know, and it can bring about amendments, mm. right? And, and it can bring about better laws, which is also an important aspect. Uh, for, for the rule of law. Yeah. Sure. Thanks so much, Ambi. I, okay. Uh, we have an associate, Jace, who has a question. Hi, Jace. You can go ahead and post your question. Hi. Hi, Dr. Th thanks for the session. It was really, really interesting. I actually have a question about how you separate your emotions or at least uh, try to be a bit. Um, Try, try to take away the emotions from the work that you put in, considering these are all public interest work and, and they can get quite personal sometimes. Like I would assume citizenship cases can get quite personal and quite emotional. So as a lawyer, how do you take away the emotions from the work that you do? Or do you find that because you invest so much of your emotions into the cause that it kind of helps you become a better litigator altogether? Oh, well, that's a superb question. I haven't done the citizenship cases, I must tell you. But I have done cases that relate to refugees, for example. And uh, uh, I mean, I mean, how do I put it? it? The passion is far greater, let me tell you. 
And there's no harm in speaking with passion, but you also have to be uh, impassionate. Yeah, I mean, do you, you know what I mean? In other words, when you speak with passion, you're committed to the cause. The cause could, because you're dealing with children's lives, etc. it would be very strange if you were totally detached. But at the end of the day, you are a professional. So you cannot go overboard because the whole point of your being there is to not necessarily take away the emotion, but to reduce the emotion and put forward the legal position. Uh, so, but I'm not, I mean, honestly, I have, I do, it does affect my submissions. I have to be frank because we're all human. And this particular refugee cases, there were children involved and they were trying to ship them back to, to Myanmar, to, to the, uh, and so it was really hard. They were putting them on ships and just piling them back. And uh, the Rohingya uh, refugees. So it was, it was, and the other side was fighting very hard as well, all right, to be able to do that. So I think there, uh, sometimes, yes, you do get emotional, but ultimately you need to always check yourself and say, you need to make sure the law works, that the facts come within that and then you, you put forward to the court an honest argument. And, uh, uh, and I think that's, that's the best you can do. But you know what? Now and then speaking passionately is really not a bad thing. That's, that's my view. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Are there any other questions amongst the associates? I, I do actually have a question. Okay, go ahead, Michelle. Yes. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Um, yes, actually, I'm really interested in climate change issues, and mm. it's it's something that I actually have talked to my partner about uh, wanting to do some cases about it. And of course, they're very supportive, but it's like we have to go and find these opportunities. So I heard what you were saying about joining the Bar Council committees, and there is an environmental and climate change committee, I believe, but is there any like litigation opportunities that we could find, or is there any other advice you have in terms of climate change issues? Okay, I, uh, Jia Yao is the, is the environmental head uh, in the Bar Council, and I think you need to have a chat with him. Now, recently, we sent out a letter to the DBKL, for example, uh, the seven residents, right? So my name is there, Jia Yao's name is there too. Uh, so in a sense, uh, that one may well progress to litigation. And I'll keep you in mind <laughs> if we need a team of young lawyers, because that's what we are hoping to get. Wajet is solicitor at the moment, but he can't handle it alone. We will, it may well, we are hoping it will become, a, there'll be more uh, plaintiffs. So when that grows, I will contact Greg and say, hey, <laughs> can we can we borrow Michelle <laughs> to help? But speak to Jiao because we have an idea about the litigation. This, is, this may not be the only strategic litigation on the cards. So if I were you, I'd contact him and then just say that you have, spoken to me and I said, keep your name on record. Yeah. Okay, I'll do that. Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> that sounds very exciting. <laughs> well, if uh, no other associates had any questions for, for Ambi, I think Ambi, if it's all right uh, for us to end the session there. That's fine. Thank you so much, Ambi. Yeah, it's a very, very useful uh, session and as always very inspiring uh, speaking. <laughs> you <laughs> thank you so much thank you thanks thank you. all the best to everyone yeah good luck bye bye yeah